Good afternoon. I'm Michel Leberge. I'm the founder and the chief scientific guy at General Fusion. It's a company in Vancouver, Canada. And we're going to develop fusion and save the planet. So I did my PhD in laser fusion, which is one way of doing fusion. And then I didn't write quite enough scientific papers, so I couldn't become a professor, which is what I wanted to do. So I ended up in the, uh, in the industry. I did laser printer. That's not very exciting. They were big laser printer for the printing industry. However, there I learned to be a bit more practical. You know, when you're an academic, you drink coffee, you go to conference. But uh, in, the public, in the private, there's, a, there's something called a client. And the client wants his machine, he wants it now, it has to be cheap. So I learned to be a little bit more practical. So I did 10 years of that, got a bit bored of laser printer. And I was looking at the energy situation and I said, whoa, this is not going good. We need to fix that. So I remember from my PhD about fusion. Most people in the business think that fusion will eventually run the planet, that's for sure. But they don't all agree when this is going to happen. So I decided to start a company to make fusion happen quicker and get there faster and save the planet. So as you're probably familiar, the problem is that we're making too much CO2 by burning too much fossil fuel. This is the graph of the amount of fossil fuel and various energy produced in the, in the world from, from 1940 to now, from last year. The problem is if you look at the big tree wedge, those are oil, gas, and coal, and the tiny, witsy little wedge on the top, this is actually renewable energy. Now, you're used to see this graph with a bigger part of renewable energy, because usually the graph is only for electricity. This is the graph for all the energy on the planet. And also, there's a tiny little annoying law of physics. It's a thermodynamic law that's called Carnot efficiency which means that if you burn some gas, only one-third make electricity or push on your plane or your car, and two-thirds is dumped as heat. But this also counts for the, the global warming. So this is a total energy, including the two-third loss, and for the whole planet. And as you can see, we're not doing too, too good on the energy transition. The energy transition is not quite transitioning. Now, on top of a mountain in Hawaii, there's a little shed, and there's a bunch of guys there that have been measuring the carbon CO2 in the air for the last 60 years. They might be getting a bit bored. But they produce this graph, which is the CO2 in the air as a function of time. And you can see it's going up and up and up and up. I put on there the different conference that they were to reduce CO2. And, uh, you know, the Kyoto Accord and the Paris thing. But look at the curve. It's going up and up and up. And it's not paying the slightest bit of attention to all those conferences. Why would that be? Like, we all want to save the CO2 but we don't seem to be doing it. This graph here is the price of electricity as a function of how much wind and solar you have in your, in your thing. And you can see it costs more and more. So the cost of changing from fossil fuel to those things is, is high. It costs more to do energy this way. Now, people say the wind and solar will be cheap. This is true right out of the solar panel or right out of the windmill. But if you include the whole system with the backup plan and the transmission line, this actually is more expensive. Now, some people say, well, we should make energy more expensive because we need to save the big disaster with climate. That's a valid point. But historically, people are not doing that. What people do usually is they, they try to improve the standard of living and the hell with the pollution. So at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the picture on the left in, in uh, London, people started producing cheap goods and the standard of living of people went really high and that was good. But it makes a lot of pollution. Eventually, the pollution was so bad that they said, oh, maybe we should put filter on, on the chimney. Now, it costs money to put filter, but when the disaster becomes more expensive than the filter, we do it. But we never do it before. We only do it after. Nowadays, London is pretty clean. There's actually even salmon going up in the thing. But this is not quite the case for CO2. The cost of changing from fossil fuel to something else is more expensive than the disaster that we have today. So what can we do to fix that? We can wait until the disaster becomes more disastrous, which is not a very good solution, or we can invent a new way of making energy that will truly be competitive with fossil fuel. So now, to explain you how that works, it's fusion energy, I, will have, I have to give you a little physics course. So sorry about that. At the end of the day like this, having a course on physics, that's a little rough. Uh, but anyway, there'll be an exam, so pay attention. So the normal reactor we have now for, for uh, the, the fission reactor that exists today, a neutron hit a big nucleus of uranium, the big nucleus split in two, 
and then there's a couple of neutrons that fly out, and that goes and make a chain reaction. It's very nice, makes a lot of energy, no pollution. However, those two big bits that are produced, they're radioactive, and they last for 10,000 years. So people are a little scared of fission, and that has slowed down the acceptance of this sort of energy. But there's another reaction that exists, and it's fusion. Fusion is the reaction that runs the sun and all the stars in the universe. This is a reaction that the, the universe used to make energy. How does it work? It works by putting two small nucleus together and make a bigger one. The easiest reaction to do is between deuterium and tritium. Those are isotope of hydrogen. Deuterium is not normal hydrogen, but we take an extra neutron. Tritium is an extra two extra neutron. You fuse that together, it makes helium. Helium is a nice, safe gas that you have party balloon with. So this is a very good solution. However, the problem with fusion is that those two pieces that you're trying to fuse together, they're both electrically charged, and they don't want to fuse. They bounce off like this, and at normal temperature, nothing happens. The temperature is a measurement of how fast the little atom wiggle in the gas. So if you hit the gas very hot, it will go fast enough to fuse. The only problem is you need the same temperature as the middle of the sun, which is 100 million degrees C. So that is kind of a little difficult to deal with. Now, people have been working on fusion for 60 years, and mostly those are big academic lab and big national lab. And the machine they, they came up with is the tokamak. The tokamak is a donut-shaped machine with big coil around it that makes a magnetic field in, in a circle. At the very high temperature of the gas, the collision between the atoms are so violent that the electron go flying one way and the nucleus go flying the other way and make a big mess of electron and nucleus. And this is called a plasma. So the plasma in the plasma, it gets stuck in the magnetic field. The particles, they spiral around the magnetic field, go around and around the donut, and they never touch the wall. And then they put some microwave oven and something to get the temperature up to go temperature. So right now, they're building something called ITER in the south of France. It's, uh, they actually stopped counting the money, but I think that's about $30 billion or so. And that will be running in about five or 10 years. It's a very big machine, very complicated, but most physicists think that this machine will actually make energy. The other way of doing that is laser fusion, which I was studying for my PhD. You take a very small pellet, you shoot laser all around it, whoops, and then when the laser hit, it squashed the pellet. When you squash something, it gets hotter. So if you squash it really, really fast, you can get to fusion temperature. There's a big machine near San Francisco at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. It's called NIF, the National Industrial Facility. It's two football size by a pile of laser, and they focus all this energy in this little target on the bottom right there. And that machine actually, last year, achieved more fusion out than the energy to cook the gas at the beginning for the first time. Now, this is a very good result, and this is not coming out of nowhere. The fusion have done great progress over the year. So this is the amount of fusion that people were managing to do over the time. So between 1960 and 2000, the number of fusion reactions that people could do increased by 10,000 times. This is as fast as the very famous Moore's law of the number of transistors on a chip. But about the year 2000, suddenly the dots started drifting to the right. And the reason for that is the machine became very expensive. So nowadays, the NIF is now in the power plant region because it gets more energy, and ITER will do that in 2035. The problem is those two machines, the tokamak thing and the laser thing, they were experimental machines to show that fusion can be done. They were never designed to make an actual power plant. So people in the academia are now trying to turn those machines into a power plant, and that is very, very difficult to do. Those machines are totally unpractical, very expensive, and they say that it's going to take like 50 years to make a power plant out of this thing, and they're probably right. But people think that fusion will happen in 50 years, and that's not very good. Nowadays, there's a bit of a change to fusion. Because we know it's pretty close, the private industry are jumping in. So this is the number of companies that do fusion as a function of time. So today, there's about 40 companies making fusion energy. And what's interesting is those companies want to make the fusion a little bit different in such a way that is nice and practical for a power plant, much more practical than what the academic are doing. Now, for example, we can take the best company in there, which happened to be General Fusion. Well, <laughs> I'm a bit, a bit biased. Anyway, so what we want to do is we want to make a bucket full of liquid metal and spin it so there's a hole in the center. We throw in there some plasma with magnetic field. We put some steam on some piston. The piston comes in. 
the liquid comes in and compress the thing. So it's a bit of a mix between the laser and the, and the tokamak. And this is good for all bunch of reasons that I don't have time to explain, but take my word, this is an awesome way of doing it. Now, between a nice little diagram like that and actually making it, there is a very long <laughs> amount of work. And there's a lot of trial and error. So I'll give you a little quick history of, of what we tried at General Fusion. So the first thing we did is we built a tank about this big out of aluminum. We put some plasma in it. We put some high explosive around it. We brought that to the field. The container here contained the equipment to dig. The plasma went on top. We put some explosive. We blow it up. This is much fun. Most technical people kind of like playing with explosives. That's a, that's a thing. Anyway, so when we started doing that, the magnetic field in the tank was twisted in a way called a spheromac. You can drop that at uh, dinner time. It's a nice scientific word. Uh, we read somewhere in a paper that would be a good target. However, it was cooling down faster than the implosion, and therefore it was not getting hotter and hotter and hotter, so that didn't work. Then we changed the twist in the magnetic field to make it the same as the tokamak. And then we noticed that plasma was lasting six times longer, and now when we started exploding this, that should have worked. However, some bits of metal from the tank was going in the plasma, cooling it down. Uh, some more problem. So we invented some sort of crazy coating to fix that. Then we try again, and then the plasma compressed, and then it went blah, 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 and disappeared. And this is because you need the exact right amount of twist to keep the plasma nice and stable. So we changed the twist during the compression, and then finally, after a bunch of years and 17 explosions, we managed to make the compression work nicely. The heat gets hotter and hotter. The number of neutrons that we measure for the fusion was increasing during implosion. Good success. So then we say, okay, time to make those things a bit bigger. So we built a two meter diameter tube, plasma, and we wanted to shove that in a cone, the cone that you see that, to make the plasma denser and, and more dense. And then we wanted to put it in this piston machine where the piston hit the liquid lithium, makes a shock wave, and compress it. Well, that didn't kind of work off, like, according to plan. In the cone, when we push with the magnetic field, the magnetic field mess up the twisty field, and the plasma went blah, 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 and disappear again. And also, when we were trying to compress with shockwave, the shockwave were losing too much energy compared to, to what we did. So we said, hmm, what are we going to do? So we changed the idea. We forgot about this cone business. We put the plasma in a two-meter diameter tank, and then we want to put the liquid in there slowly, a bit like syringe. And then we try that with water at small scale. So we wanted to make a spherical pile of liquid that we implode. And again, when we did that, there was some wave on the surface of the liquid, and when we implode it, it was not symmetric enough. And if the, if the liquid is not very symmetric, the plasma will go blah, 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 and you're going to lose it. The plasma have a little tendency of going blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so we changed that from a spherical thing to a cylindrical thing, and then we, we compress it with cylinder. But if you compress with a cylinder, it gets long and thin towards the end, and the plasma goes blah, 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 blah. So we changed that for the piston on the top and the bottom to fire first. So as it implodes, the liquid implodes in a more like spherical thing, and that turned out to work pretty good. So the, what we wanted to do after that is to make a big machine like that with liquid metal and piston. However, the price of that turned out to be fairly expensive. So in order to have more chance of trying the investment to do, we decided to narrow that to something called the LM26. And the LM26 is we take the plasma in, in blue, and we fire that in this purple tube of lithium, and then we fire a big coil, a big magnetic coil to implode it with the, the, the solid tube. And that's to show the demonstration of the compression. By early next year, we want to show 1 keV, which is 10 million degrees C, one-tenth of the fusion temperature. Then at the end of next year, we want to make 10 keV, which is a temperature that you need for fusion, 100 million degree. And then next year, we want to put more plasma in it in order to get more density and achieve break-even in about two years. Now, this, for example, is one of the... This is one of the coils that will compress the plasma that's being built at the office right now. But as you see, one of the things that will slow us down a bit is we, we have to find the, the money for this thing. So fusion is very nice, but you need to feed the cash for it. So over the next... Oh, that's step one. After we finish this LM26 machine, we want to make a commercial machine about the size of a commercial machine, but with the implosion rate not being so fast and without the turbine and everything. And by mid-35, by mid-30s, we want to make the first of a kind power plant. So that's the plan. Again, for the money. So the amount of money that went in those 40 companies is about $6 billion over the last 
couple of years, so it's about $2 billion a year, and that looks like a very impressive number. However, for energy feature, this is actually peanuts. You can look at the, sub the sub subsidies for, for uh, fossil fuel, and it is $1 trillion per year. Not billion, a trillion. So the world is putting a trillion in subsidies for fossil fuel, and we only need a couple of billion. For wind solar, this is about 100 billion a year in, 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 uh, in money towards that. Now, those 40 companies, they will need a couple of million, of to all $10 million, to see if it works a little bit, and many will die because it won't work. Then a few will need like hundreds of millions of dollars to show that you can break break even. Lots will die, but some will achieve that. And at the end, a few will need a couple of billion dollars to make a power plant. So we estimate that the total amount of money required for at least one of these companies to make fusion is about $50 billion. That looks like a big number, but that's actually quite small. $50 billion to produce the ultimate source of energy to mankind that will solve all our problems, I think that's worth paying. It's only 4% of the annual subsidies for fossil fuel. So I think that fusion energy is a pretty hot potatoes. Thank you.